Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Mark. And of course, uh, thank you, Dean. Uh, it's very nice to, I'm going to put the mute on. Great. So I don't hear the echo. Uh, I want to, you know, thank you all for, um, for hosting me. And of course, it's, I would have been better to join you in person, but I'm, I'm very happy to be able to join you virtually. So I'm going to talk today about a project uh, that I'm working on with a co-author, um, talk about interdisciplinarity. Um, this co-author is actually in, in physics at the University of College London, uh, Andrea Baron Kelly. Uh, and the, the main question that we're trying to answer with this project is how do uh, social norms or social conventions emerge out of a state of nature in which there's an originally sort of disorganized population in which there's no form of social coordination to start with. Uh, and the, the literature on this problem, you know, dates back uh, a very long time. And most recently and most formally, we've been trying to study this as a, as a problem of diffusion. Um, and my own work actually starts with that, that sort of basis um, for thinking about these collective dynamics. And so the typical way of thinking about this is that there's some sort of uh, seed in a network that's sort of exogenously placed into it. This is really starting from kind of a disease diffusion model of um, exogenous in, um, kind of uh, intervention. And then that's sort of spreading from neighbor to neighbor through a contact network. Um, and my work on this problem on uh, complex contagions really emphasized the differences between simple contagions like disease or information that spread very quickly through uh, randomized networks uh, and complex contagions like behavior change, which tend to require social reinforcement and actually spread more effectively through clustered networks. Now, my work uh, building on really a, a tremendous literature in, in applied math and physics uh, used computational models to study this. Uh, and then I most recently have been developing experiments to evaluate those models, in which we've been able to sort of discriminate the effects of network topology on these diffusion dynamics. One of the beautiful things about being able to collect those kinds of uh, experimental data is that they actually not only are able to test uh, the formal models, but able to inform the formal models. And that's really where this project starts off, is that the more I thought about this problem of behavior change, the more I thought about you know that empirical test of, of how uh, any kind of behavior change would spread from the spread of a collective action to, you know, the growth of a new social norm uh, to the adoption of a technology, the more I realized that when we think about norms and social order more generally uh, as a problem of, of social coordination, uh, the problem is actually quite a bit more complex than just the diffusion of behavior. Um, in fact, what winds up happening is um, people have to adjust uh, their their behaviors based on their expectations of what other people will do. Uh, and this really takes on the form of an evolutionary dynamic. Um, so instead of an externally behave, uh, extern sort of external behavior um, uh, seeded into a population and spreading, really individuals interact with one another. Um, and based on how people respond to their behaviors, they're able to kind of creatively innovate um, and change their sort of behavior set um, come up with new options and see how people respond to those. Uh, and of course, uh, as people respond to those options, they develop expectations about other people's uh, behaviors and also expectations for how other people are interpreting their own behaviors. Um, and this you know, becomes kind of a, a thick space of um, beliefs about beliefs um, and emotional responses and so forth. And the more that we kind of unpack this process, the more we realize this, this space of expectation formation about behaviors really isn't the same thing as just a single behavior either spreading or not spreading, but is this sort of creative process that requires um, a lot of you know, spontaneous innovation by people. Uh, and not only do I have to interact with one other person and figure this out, but simultaneously I'm also interacting with other people and that person's interacting with other people and of course those people are interacting with other people and so on and so forth. And so this is a very complex process of uh, social evolution that allows an entire population to coordinate on some sort of uh, collective norm or, or, or social convention um, that at the outset may not even exist in the population. It has to be sort of generated through these uh, creative interactions. The, the sort of most amazing thing about these norms, and this is something that you know, sociologists have spent generations thinking about, is that once they become established, um, it, it appears as if uh, there could not have been any other norm. I and mean, we see this in and people who grew up generationally in, uh, in societies where you know, norms or conventions are, are fairly concrete or they're sort of locked in socially, um, they tend to carry a kind of moral weight uh, where people believe that that social convention is simply the correct one. Um, but you know, as, as social theorists, we know that uh, 
uh, in fact, any number of social conventions uh, could have happened. And when we look across cultures, although we see tremendous uh, coherence and uh, homogeneity within the culture, uh, different cultures have very different standards for gender conventions, um, for race conventions, uh, for norms about politeness, uh, for standards of breeding, standards of fairness. Um, all of these things vary tremendously, which tells us there's no one right answer. In fact, there's a social process that gives rise to some kind of collective convergence. And in fact, uh, I think the default in you know several generations ago had been to assume that if there's a social norm that's locked in, um, it's somehow welfare producing. Um, there's this fantastic quote by Ken Arrow where he actually says that's what norms are. They, they perform a social function. Um, but, you know, several uh, pieces of work, including my own work on the emperor's dilemma, studies how norms that are uh, explicitly not functional. And in the case of the emperor's dilemma, we studied uh, norms that were uh, unpopular in the sense that um, they were undesirable both at an individual level and a collective level. Um, so they were, you know, uni universally welfare reducing. Um, and nevertheless, they could become socially reinforced um, throughout a population. People would not only comply with them, but actually uh, enforce them on all of their neighbors. Uh, and so what this tells us is that the existence of a norm in society for this evolutionary process doesn't tell us anything about, uh, you know, why it's there. Uh, the norm itself is, is a kind of, um, pro you know, function of this, of this social process, which really raises the question, um, where do these norms come from, right? How, how do we actually get a grip on them in the first place? Uh, and of course, this is a problem that dates back to antiquity. Aristotle first you know, discussed this question. But to my mind, it was really the Enlightenment philosophers who sort of first formalized this question uh, very clearly. Uh, you know, uh, Hobbes, Hume, and Rousseau all kind of addressed this problem in their own way. Um, and to, to my mind, the Humean approach or Hume's puzzle is the one that really frames the question that we're after. And this is actually the question I'm going to try to try to address today. Um, where he says, two neighbors may agree to drain a meadow that they possess in common because it's easy for them to know each other's mind. And each may perceive that the immediate consequence of failing in his or her own part is the abandoning of the whole project. But it's difficult and indeed impossible that a thousand persons should agree to any such action. So Hume is really very clearly problematizing the micro-macro problem. He's saying two people through a process of trial and error can eventually figure out that they have a common goal and agree on how to achieve that common goal together. But as those people interact with other people and still other people, that process of local coordination takes on very complex dynamics and it's hard to imagine how that would ever aggregate um, to an entire population. So that really frames sort of the theoretical puzzle of social order of how you know, interactions ever aggregate to produce kind of, um, a social norm at the population level. This also faces us with a very, very clear empirical problem, uh, which is the case that any of the social norms that we'd want to study, from uh, gender conventions to um, standards of fairness uh, to linguistic conventions, are already occurring in society, which means that there's a tremendous history to all of these interactions. There's um, institutions that have helped to facilitate them. Um, and getting an empirical grip on what the kind of origin story is of how this process happens um, from the ground up is very, very difficult. And so the approach that I'm going to present today is an experimental approach. And I want to make it really clear that I'm not talking about a psychology experiment, which is the way that we've typically thought about experiments in social science, which is that you know, we, we give a person um, one kind of uh, experience and we give a different person a different experience um, and then evaluate the differences in their individual responses. Um, and we repeat that process again and again to get some kind of statistical uh, evaluation over, over many uh, trials. The strategy here is a, is a sociological strategy. And by sociological experiment, what I really mean is that what we want to do is independently manipulate the entire structure of a society and see if it produces a collective outcome that's different. Um, and I think that methodologically, the, the kind of um, origin point here is really Durkheim's work on suicide, where he takes this idea of being able to independently compare entire society side by side and tries to identify suicide not as a, a, a behavior that one person engaged in. He doesn't try to explain causally why one person or, or another person did or didn't commit suicide. He takes an entire society, describes its social structure, and then looks at the distribution of suicides over that population. 
Then he takes an entirely different society and says, look, there's a different social structure here, but everything else is held constant. And now we get a different distribution of suicides. And so each entire society is a single observation. And that's exactly the strategy I want to use today. I want to try to describe how um, con comparing different societies side by side um, will allow us to evaluate how simple changes to their underlying social structure will endogenously produce the capacity either for social conventions to form or the failure to, to achieve uh, large scale social conventions. And of course, our assumption at the outset is that the success or failure of social conventions doesn't depend on a specific answer being present in the population. You can imagine the same ecology of options circulating in a population. But based on the social structure, either that ecology will produce uh, coherent convergence um, or it will fail. And there's many ways of thinking about social structure. I want to emphasize that uh, the networks approach isn't the only approach. Of course, you can think about institutions for redistribution and taxation. You can think about um, distributions of uh, traits or demography. You can think about um, uh, group sizes and heterogeneity across a population. All of these things are important forms of social structure. I specifically focus on um, network topology as the variable I want to look at um, because of the, again, because of the framing of the puzzle originally in Hume, which I think is, is fairly close to the way that we're thinking about it today, um, which is essentially that we want to look at this sort of pairwise problem of people trying to coordinate with one another and see what this means in terms of the aggregation process of sequential coordination throughout an entire network. Um, so my approach here is that I'm going to present a little bit of theoretical background of the model that I'm, I'm using to, uh, to study this problem. But the real focus is going to be here on the empirical work. So I'm going to present to you the experimental design and then, of course, the empirical findings, which I think are actually fairly exciting. Um, so this paper isn't out yet. We're still kind of uh, developing the presentation for it, but we're very, very excited about these results. Uh, so the, the theoretical the background for this question really starts with the, the fundamental human um, puzzle, which is, you know, where do norms come from? How is it possible that societies can self-organize at a very large level? Uh, and the answer has been um, pretty much, you know, for, for centuries now, that there's some form of institutional mechanism that governs this process. Um, it, th that institutional mechanism can either be an authority figure, and here we're thinking of, you know, in, in the main, something like the government that mandates driving them left or driving them right. Um, it mandates the sorts of languages we use um, and, and, you know, punishes deviance and thereby, you know, kind of enforces global coordination across the population. But this kind of incentive can also be a positive incentive. Organizations frequently attempt to um, explicitly or implicitly manage the collective behavior of their populations by incentivizing people to engage in certain behaviors, not others. Um, and so what this does is this is able to collectively drive an entire population to converge on a, a certain kind of behavior, uh, which of course once it's achieved is self-reinforcing. Now, it's often the case that we see examples of large-scale collective behavior and large-scale coordination without any obvious authority figure, either a government or an organization, driving this coordination process. Um, and so it kind of problematizes the question of, well, how could this ever happen if there isn't you know, a centralized authority um, you know, incentivizing it? And one of the, I think, most uh, compelling answers has come from uh, Harkasanya and Selden's work on um, payoff dominance um, or risk dominance um, in, the, in the alternatives that people are choosing between. So they won the Nobel Prize for this work. Um, and what they essentially are, uh, argue is that there's some fundamental bias um, in the options that people are choosing between, where uh, one of them is either uh, just obviously um, worth more than the other, or um, one of them is safer. Uh, it's less risky than the other one. And what they notice is that through the sort of dynamics of integrated interaction, the, the, the option that's either the higher payoff option or the option that's less risky um, is individually preferred. And that individual preference um, you know, incrementally aggregates to produce a collective preference where individuals notice that other people are, you know, have a, have a slight bias towards one app option. And of course they have a bias towards that option as well. And then over the entire population that can then result in collective lock-in on that one particular option. So that provides a solution of how this can sort of happen without an authority figure. However, there's fairly thick institutional assumptions still. We have to assume that everyone has um, 
uh, a sense of what the collective payoffs are for the options, that there's only a, a finite set of options, um, and that everyone knows what everyone else's payoffs are as well. So there's this sort of, you know, this common knowledge um, that pervades the entire process of normative convergence. And this, this eliminates the question of how people um, coordinate on uh, options when there's no differences intrinsically or a priori in the payoffs or um, choices that they're, that they're evaluating. Um, and further, it doesn't explain how this happens when um, there's no real sense of uh, what other people have in their heads in terms of their evaluation set. And so when we tend to think about this occurring in kind of the larger space of uh, cultural media or cultural norms or linguistic norms, um, where there's many, many options, people can innovate, and there's no real differences between them, um, we're left, again, without an explanation of how that can happen. So one of the most popular explanations uh, in the sociological literature on, on this is, is informational feedback or cumulative advantage, which is that one option really gains traction just through sort of stochastic processes. And then that option um, becomes uh, sort of more available in the population and reported as such. And then that generates a, a kind of a feedback effect. This solution, however, relies on some sort of typically, um, some sort of polling mechanism that can sample over the entire population simultaneously and then report back um, in, a, in a kind of a collective form the, the instantaneous state of the population. So we think here of like bestseller licks um, or polls, um, which are you know, very co uh, common in sort of voting situations. Right? We say, what's the state of the population? What's everyone doing? Um, or what's the most popular book? Or what's the most popular movie? What's everyone doing? Um, and this this helps to facilitate the feedback um, and then ultimately coordination. Again, it also requires really thick institutional mechanisms in the sense there needs to be a way of polling the entire population simultaneously, extracting the information about what everyone's doing, and then reporting that back in a coherent way that everyone knows how to how to interpret, and furthermore, that everyone's actually already paying attention to. They know that there's this reporting system. Um, so these three solutions have all, I think, made important progress in trying to understand this problem, but they still leave open the question of how it, uh, social conventions and social norms ever get started in the first place without any institutional mechanisms in place to already facilitate the process. Uh, and the answer um, that I think is, is most compelling in the literature now is the, the social evolutionary uh, response, which is that just through the process of individuals interacting in social networks, these micro-level interactions can aggregate, um, sort of, you know, uh, sort of build up to produce a collective level coordination um, throughout a social network without anyone ever intending it, without any incentives for trying to do it, and without really any information about what the global state of the population is. So really as an unintended consequence of individual interactions, the collective population winds up all agreeing on this behavior. So the way this has been approached from a kind of a formal point of view is to really study this as a, as a coordination problem. Um, and this, you know, in the kind of formal game theoretic uh, sense. Uh, and when we, when we think about that from a network's perspective, this has really specific implications. So it means that, um, you know, two people who are trying to coordinate with one another, um, on the left-hand side, you can see a spatial network, and then in the middle, you can see a random network, and on the far right, you can see kind of the homogenous mixing case. Um, and in most of this literature, the far left and far right have been the two that have been compared. It's either a kind of spatial local network or a, um, a homogenous mixing network. And the argument has been, and, and series in, of, of models have shown this, that the spatial networks are far, far superior for generating um, rapid coordination. Now, if you let any of these networks go, uh, like evolve for um, an infinite time period, um, just the process of social interaction and stochasticity will ultimately lead to convergence on some sorts of norm, norm in, in, in all of these populations. But the real question is one of time scale. Um, the real question is, what's the rate at which a population will be able to converge? And of course, for our um, purposes, where we're trying to detect this empirically, we want to know, well, what's a time scale that we could actually measure, where we could really see this process of social and local interaction aggregating to produce a kind of collective norm across a society. Um, and the, uh, the answer has, has been consistently that it's the, the clustering, uh, the clustered lattice network. Um, and the reason for that is, first of all, 
that if two people are interacting in the, in the lattice, um, they could keep interacting with the same network partners, which establishes um, reinforcement for the answers that they're receiving from that same person. Furthermore, um, two people tend to share neighbors in common. So if Bill and Tom are interacting and they agree on a norm, and Bill is a friend of Bob and Tom is a friend of Bob, then Bill and Tom can both coordinate to, to sort of force Bob um, to engage in the same behavior. Um, and that sort of power of collusion makes these clustered networks extremely powerful um, for being able to enforce the social order locally, which then spreads from neighborhood to neighborhood and makes global coordination uh, very effective. As ties are rewired, you can see in the middle random network, um, people still have a sort of same fixed neighborhoods. So they're interacting repeatedly with the same people. But those people aren't interacting with each other, and that, that makes it more difficult for coordination to get off the ground. And then in the far right-hand side, um, people are just picking others at random. So each interaction is a random interaction um, without any really repeated contact. Uh, and as a result, it's very hard for people to figure out um, expectations about what the next person they're going to interact with is going to do. So this is the standard way of thinking about uh, this problem of, of the emergence of conventions from a kind of local self-organizing uh, perspective through the lens of social networks. The approach that we're going to take complicates this a little bit by asking a further question, uh, which is that almost all of this work has assumed that people are choosing between two options, uh, for example, A and B, um, which means that at the outset, although people are coordinating locally, People in remote parts of the network have the same options that are available to them. Everyone starts with either A or B available. Uh, and the question is whether you know, the particular equilibrium gets chosen. But in real social conventions, right, in social emergence in the natural world, uh, people have this capacity to spontaneously innovate. Um, and this complicates the story considerably because it means that new options can pop up in different regions of the network uh, where um, other regions have no uh, sense that those options are even a possibility. And so people in one uh, area can be uh, all working on trying to sort of agree on one set of options. And the a set of options that sort of emerge spontaneously in a different region can be entirely different. Um, this has dramatic implications for network structure. Uh, and in fact, all of the work on uh, looking at these kinds of innovation models um, and also on the idea of, of information diffusion, the spread of kind of new options across a population, has emphasized the value of random networks. And of course, the randomly mixing model on the far right-hand side is the ideal case for this, because it means a new option can spread uh, almost immediately across a population. Um, and so what we're interested in with this project is trying to combine the, the fundamental question of, of local social coordination with the opportunities that people have to innovate as part of this process and to see how those two interact to affect um, the ways that, that, that networks generate uh, collective coordination in, the, in a population. So the way that we study this is uh, in, called the name game, is really by looking at the process of the emergence of linguistic forms and linguistic conventions. Um, and this approach to studying social conventions dates back to Wittgenstein, um, who first really kind of formalized this idea of thinking about social conventions as kind of a two-person uh, lingu linguistic coordination problem. Uh, and the basic sort of setup is that uh, two people um, independently look at an object. And their goal is to come up with a, a common name for it so they can communicate with each other. Uh, now, they independently sort of propose names for this object. Uh, and then each time they both propose a name, they can see uh, which name the other person proposed. And they sort of accrue um, a memory of options uh, and then as this memory uh, increases and increases, people are able to eventually, through a process of trial and error, figure out what option the other person is going to say next, and then they're able to uh, come up with a consensus term. Uh, now, so that's the sort of coordination part that maps uh, fairly clearly onto the standard coordination uh, game way of thinking about this process of convention. However, um, in this process of trial and error, people can spontaneously uh, suggest new options and creatively respond to the options that they've been given. Um, so they can combine different words or just sort of suggest a new word. Uh, and all of this then creates an, an, a sort of an innovation aspect to this problem. And of course, our question is how, how does the 
the interaction network affect the way that this um, local process then aggregates over an entire population? And how does it really affect the possibility for conventions to uh, emerge at all? So uh, we've done a, a series of, of formal papers, and Andrea has done uh, works really since the, uh, 2006, building kind of uh, large theoretical literature around this question. Um, our goal is to be able to study this empirically. Now, when we move to studying this empirically, you can appreciate that there, there are um, several very difficult problems that um, make this a, a difficult problem to study. Uh, now, there's been a lot of work and a lot of discussion about the difficulty of studying diffusion in social networks, the simple problem of identifying a contagion dynamic and identifying how social interactions affect that dynamic, and really the causality of spreading. Um, and people, uh, I think, over the last five years have done tremendous amounts of work to um, advance that discussion. Um, Matt had a great presentation yesterday on this um, this kind of work, uh, thinking about you know in, um, very controlled observations of um, you know in, in essentially with natural experimental settings, trying to figure out you know the exact network structure and what the exact path is of, of behaviors through that. Um, and then my own work also thinking about it from an experimental point of view is used online networks to be able to control the network structure and look at diffusion. Uh, and so with, with that sort of, uh, I think, advance in our ways of thinking about this question, this new question of the evolution of norms um, actually presents a set of new challenges that, that need to be handled in addition to the kind of well understood challenges of, of addressing the dynamics of contagion in networks. Uh, one of the most prominent of these challenges is group size. So there's been a tremendous amount of work starting in the 50s and 60s at MIT and Harvard on um, small group lab experiments. And this group uh, research really developed through the uh, 80s, 90s. And in fact, most recently in 2007, uh, Richard Selton, the Nobel laureate, was doing very interesting work on um, language convention um, and you know, experiments of just two to four people. Um, th the important thing about being able to formalize um, these kinds of dynamics in, in models uh, before we're able to study them empirically, is that it gives us a sense of what the relevant um, in, sort of parameter space is for group size. And what we're able to find is that in these particular models of, of uh, evolution of social conventions, for groups that are below a size of 20, uh, the dynamics um, are exactly the opposite for groups that are above a size of 20. And that's incredibly important because almost all of the work that's been done, or in fact all of the work that's been done, looking at the endogenous dynamics of um, cultural evolution in social interactions, the sort of thing that we want to study, um, producing social conventions, uh, has studied either two, four, eight, or 12 people, uh, which means that those dynamics don't tell you really much at all about what's going on as you generalize to 100, 1,000, or 100,000 people. Um, so you need to study larger groups. Uh, in order to really understand how these results would aggregate, um, and and really for the you know question of external validity, how they would apply to other situations. Now the advantage uh, of of this information is that it also tells us that we don't need to study 61 million people at the same time. Um, all we really need to do is to study group sizes that are um, well above that well uh, above that critical point um, of 20. And if we're able to do that, uh, then our results, according to the model, should generalize to larger and larger populations. Uh, and that gives us insight into what happens when we aggregate up to 100 million or you know, 9 billion, um, because those dynamics are expected to be the same. Uh, and so what we do then is to, to identify this critical point and then start above it and uh, incrementally look at, at how these uh, dynamics aggregate. Uh, there's been attempts to solve using economic games where people have been doing uh, lab group experiments um, with you know groups of size uh, 30 or 36. Uh, Michael Kearns is one of these people and that's an incredibly important work that's that sort of pushed the boundaries of thinking about what you can do in a laboratory. Um, unfortunately because of the complexities of studying real-time uh, behavioral dynamics those experiments have really focused on economic games where people are given one or two set of options they're given um, you know fixed payoffs for those options um, and they're not, you know, they're not allowed to innovate. Um, and furthermore, they're given global information about the state of the world. Uh, and so this kind of, um, all those provides sort of uh, important methodological uh, innovations into, into thinking about how to study these problems. Uh, 
Um, it doesn't address the fundamental question of how social evolution occurs just through local interactions with you know, spontaneous uh, innovations. Now, the, the sort of natural response from a lot of researchers these days is to move to big data. And I would say it makes a lot of sense. It's a very good idea because big data provides um, the behavioral fluidity of natural uh, evolutionary um, interactions. And it also, um, of course, allows people to get very, very good um, uh, longitudinal data, very precise data, and also you know, data at scale um, where networks tend to be fairly well resolved. Uh, the problem with studying these kinds of questions and with a big data format um, is that we lose all of our experimental control on causality. It's to say, uh, we don't have any information about what sorts of leadership is um, uh, emergent in those populations um, or what other exogenous influences may be available to some people and not others, and then forms of social control and focal points as well. Uh, and so the idea that this process can happen without institutional mechanisms playing a role um, is very difficult to test in a big data environment because we're not able to eliminate those institutional mechanisms. Um, so all those three problems are kind of the default problems that we need to be able to solve in order to answer this question, uh, which we haven't been able to answer yet with existing methodologies. There's a final and fourth one which uh, hasn't really been worried about that much, and it's, it's because it's such a hard problem to get at, um, given that the other three are already you know, difficult. And this is the question of uh, replication or reproducibility. Um, so imagine you were able to solve all those three first problems. You're able to study the, you know, in a society where you knew the full structure of the network, you could study the real-time evolutionary dynamics of behavior change, and, and on, a, you know, on a measurable scale, watch the, uh, you know, the formation from a state of nature of a new social convention. Uh, and you were able to do that across um, you know, let's say compared to different societies that were otherwise in every way independent. Um, so that would be you know, re remarkable. Um, but that would really, according to sort of the, the Durkheimian methodology, that would only give you one data point. Right? A society of 100,000 people all connected in a network is a set of interdependent data points, which means those, those, each of those 100,000 people is not IID. Um, so if you want to study the collective process of aggregation and use the entire society, um, its structure as the independent variable and its uh, sort of collective pattern of social coordination as the dependent variable, um, then you need to be able to study that same society <laughs> replicated several times to get any real grip on whether there's a, a causal effect of the social structure on the, the collective process. Um, and that's been the, the real linchpin of, I think, moving the the, these questions in social science into kind of a more of a hard science direction. Uh, and so the solution to this, at least the one that I'm proposing, is that we can think about this as a, as a problem that can be studied online um, using uh, web-based experiments. Uh, and the, the, the trope or metaphor I like to use is the social petri dish. Uh, and the idea is that just like a petri dish, we can kind of create two societies side by side, um, you know, see them in exactly the same way. Uh, and um, make invisible changes to their social structure, changes that are unknown to anyone in the population. Um, and nevertheless, uh, just by virtue of people interacting with each other in a completely natural way, um, one society will grow a collective behavior and the other society will fail to. And this would give us real traction um, on the, the capacity um, of, uh, of these sort of uh, changes in network structure to be causally responsible for the emergence of collective behavior. And of course, the real punchline of this is that once we can do that once, um, the fact that we're online and the fact that all of this is built in a, in a virtual community allows us to replicate this process seamlessly again and again and again, much in the way that we, we would do um, in you know, uh, you know, wet biology or in bench science. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of straightforward thing uh, from a technical perspective, to, to do this twice once you've done it once, uh, whereas that's not always the case in the laboratory environment. Um, and I've used this kind of replication strategy in, a, in several papers um, over the years, um, and this, these papers have all been looking at typically at, at diffusion dynamics um, or at, you know changes in network topology. Um, and so the, the question here is whether we can use this to study the uh, sort of spontaneous production of collective behaviors uh, and the emergence of social conventions. Um, so the experimental design is based uh, squarely on the name game. We're using that kind of formal approach of thinking about, um, you know, 
dyadic interactions on uh, coherent naming conventions um, as our uh, as our s s empirical domain or our template for, about social conventions more generally. So participants are recruited uh, from the world, uh, world Wide Web at large using online um, recruitment ads. Um, places like um, Adweek have been very successful. Um, also through Reddit and other sources. Um, and then once they're recruited, um, they, they join the study and uh, are basically put into a pool of other people who are then sort of um, fed into uh, a, a, an online social network in which those apologies already created. Uh, once they arrive in the study and the study starts, they're given an object uh, to look at and try to name. In this case, it's a face. And of course, they interact in pairwise fashion with other members in the community, uh, just as we would imagine the name game, um, to try to coordinate using the same name. Uh, and our goal is to see whether some coherent social norm emerges based on the, the interaction structure of the network. Um, so when people actually you know, are recruited and arrive to the study, the arrival site looks like this. It's a, it's a kind of scrolling list of instructions that people are able to read while they're sitting there waiting. Um, now, you, you may ask, why, why are they waiting? Uh, they're waiting for other people to show up. And so if you think about this in terms of the, uh, the actual sort of mechanics of running an experiment, um, if we imagine three different network structures, a sort of spatial lattice or a, a random network or a sort of fully mixing population, um, we want to run all of those simultaneously. So if each network, let's say, has 20 uh, nodes in it, then we need to recruit 60 people at a time. Um, and then uh, wait for uh, when the 59th person has arrived, everyone is still sitting in this waiting page, and then the 60th person arrives. And then we randomly um, allocate uh, people to network structures. So 20 go to the spatial, 20 to the random, and 20 to the mixing. And then we initiate the game dynamics. Um, and when we initiate the game dynamics, this is the screen that people see. Um, the, the center of the uh, screen just shows a, a face and then an, an entry box where people can enter uh, whatever name they choose. The left-hand side shows a list of players, and the right-hand side uh, shows a list of rounds. Um, and so it's going to sort of the game will keep track for you which rounds you're in up to round 20. And the game has a fixed limit of 20 rounds um, and tells you the state. So you're currently in play on round one, and then once you complete round one, it'll tell you whether you matched or not. Now, when people enter the name and hit send choice. Um, it tells you to wait for your partner because people are choosing simultaneously. And then once your partner enters the name, it reports back the name that your partner gave and, of course, reports the name that you gave to your partner. Um, so if you matched, it tells you that you matched and, and pays you um, the winning amount, which is nominal, it's 25 cents um, for matching. Um, and if you fail, uh, then it actually tells you that you failed and tells you uh, what the other choice was. And so that way you can accrue a memory um, of what the other choices are in the population um, if you fail. And you can also, of course, know that your, your another name is being used if you succeed. One of the um, important things about this design is that that list of players on the left-hand side doesn't change. Um, and that's important because in the spatial network, you only had four neighbors that you'd be interacting with. And that was also the same in the random network, whereas, whereas of course, in the homogeneously mixing case, you could interact with anyone. Um, and so telling you that you only had four neighbors or telling you you had you know, 20 neighbors uh, would tell you something about the population structure. So to avoid revealing anything about the population structure, uh, we just provide that you know, complete list of names um, for everyone so that um, there's sort of uh, complete opaqueness about the differences uh, across experimental conditions. Um, so I have the mute button on. I'm going to turn that off for a second. Um, so I'm going to hear my own echo now. Uh, I want to make sure that people are clear. In order to understand the results for this experiment, um, it's important to understand this particular design. So if people have any questions about this uh, user experience, they can ask them now before I move on to the results. Uh, Mark, perhaps you can moderate here. Are, are, there any, are there any questions coming up? No, they all claim to understand it. OK, <laughs> everyone gets it. All right, great. Uh, so, uh, in, in that case, then I'm going to move on. So, uh, I'm going to move on to presenting the results from each of the networks. Okay. 
what I'm going to play for you now is a, is a movie um, in which uh, the data are just sort of played back um, in, in real time. Uh, one of the advantages of doing this kind of data collection, these experimental online environments, uh, is that instead of being able to, uh, or instead of being forced, rather, to process the data and present you know, fancy statistics that explain what happened, um, you can actually just present the raw data. This is something you're told never to do when you're in grad school. You never just show raw data. Um, but what I'm going to do is to just play for you the exact raw data of what happens. Um, and it, it actually has a, tr a tremendous uh, clarity, which is always sort of surprising to see in, in data collection. Uh, so what's going to happen is that as people choose names, um, colors are going to show up on the screen. So each node corresponds to a person. And the color of the node corresponds to the particular name they're choosing. Um, I'm also going to show you the list of names that, are, that show up. Uh, so you can see the correspondence. So here you can see people are playing the game. And as two people interact, a link forms between them. Um, and if the link is white, it means they failed to coordinate. But when the link has a color, then it indicates the, the color of the name that two people coordinated on. So you can see here the name Sarah is blue, the name Elena is uh, green, Susan is sort of green. Uh, and what you can see very quickly here is that this is uh, interacting in a spatial network. What you can see very quickly is that coordination starts to get off the ground um, in the spatial network on the top. People are coordinating on the name Sarah, and on the bottom they're coordinating on the name Elena. Uh, and so because of this, I mean, you have a third of the population coordinating already. Um, it seems like this should uh, take off very quickly. Um, and this is sort of consistent with the traditional kind of coordination model approach. Um, but what winds up happening next is pretty interesting. So you can notice between, um, right, uh, let's see here if the mouse shows up. Right here, uh, between the Elena and Lara, uh, this Elena and Sarah group, um, you, you've got this name, um, Julie, that shows up. Uh, and these people together are coordinating the name Julie, even though they're surrounded by two sort of dominant groups. And on the other side, you have a similar thing with this name, Samantha. Uh, and the, the sort of the fate of this interaction process is, is indeterminate. Um, all of these options have, you know, equal viability in terms of, you know, eventually in the long run becoming an option that everyone winds up using. And so there's no preferred option in the population. All there are uh, are a series of groups um, competing with one another. And through this process of local competition, they actually fail to achieve any kind of global coordination over the sort of span of the experimental study. Uh, so. Because of this failure, then the idea was to move to a random network and study this process again. And now, because of the sort of long distance ties, um, perhaps this would facilitate the diffusion process that would allow uh, coordination in the network. Uh, so you can send, again, uh, in the same way, you can see the process evolving, uh, people choosing uh, you know, various names and, and ties forming. But of course, these ties are now showing up across the network structure. Um, the interesting thing that, <clears throat> The interesting thing that happens uh, is that the, the choices that people are making um, tend to look a lot like uh, the, the, the dynamics that we saw in, in the first case, which is that you see the name Lisa and Jane, different names, interestingly. Uh, Sarah still showed up, but Lisa and Jane uh, becoming sort of, and Jennifer becoming popular names that are used in the population, and sort of small groups starting to form among people who uh, interact with each other. But then outside of those groups, again, there's uh, you know, different, different names that are starting to achieve dominance. And again, you get the same sort of dynamic where people are kind of competing with one another um, in these group structures, these emergent group structures, which have no kind of intrinsic value, but take on a life of their own. Yet there's no global coordination. And if you look and see some of the options people have chosen, they're People chose uh, no match, which is kind of a clever way of trying to um, get out of the problem of choosing one name or another, but to choose a, a kind of um, meta name. Um, in the previous case, people entered things like blue eyes. Uh, people said beautiful, right? So people entered categories instead of names, um, and this was, you know, a, very much along the lines that we think, uh, you know, maybe a good solution will diffuse, maybe a if there's an option that's a more attractive option, that will generate coordination. Uh, but in fact, those options were completely ineffective. 
Um, which is to say, I found that very interesting because it, it really goes to the, the kind of theoretical point that the dynamics have much more to do with the, the population structure, in this case, the network structure, than with the particular options that are present. Um, so just suggesting a particularly clever solution doesn't affect anything in terms of whether the population is able to coordinate on this solution. Uh, and so the end state of this dynamic looks very much like the end state of the spatial network. Um, and so that's also surprising because typically when we think about a diffusion, um, we think about the random network being you know, uh, the opposite extreme from a spatial network. Uh, and, and also in the other direction, we think about coordination. So to, see, so to see very similar dynamics in the random network and in the spatial network tell us that the, the dynamics aren't quite understood by the, the models that we've been using um, to study just coordination and just diffusion. So now we're going to study it in the, sort of the classic case of homogeneous mixing. Um, and in this case, I used a male name. Um, we did all of these studies with both male, male and female pictures. Um, to study to you know, make sure there's gender parity in the dynamics. Um, and you can see, as before, one name you know, has some early traction. Um, but something sort of, sort of different is happening now than happened before, um, which is that one name, you can see the name John, is starting to gain traction. And it looks like it's gaining a level of popularity that none of the names ever really achieved um, in the other network, which is to say uh, names got early starts and some names got popular quickly, but none of the names ever gained a kind of majority share of the population. They all just were competing with other names. And in that sense, there was sort of sy symmetry um, in the likelihood that any of the names would gain dominance. But all of a sudden, you have one name really taking over in the population. Now you can see it's sort of, it's sort of just exploding. And you get this kind of spontaneous creative emergence of a, of a naming option um, throughout the population. Um, and what's exciting, oops, What's exciting about that social process um, is that uh, it generates coordination um, in a way that people who have never interacted with one another before, total strangers um, towards the end of this process, total strangers are meeting. Um, and then when they meet, uh, they're able to interact spontaneously and coordinate with one another. Right, and this is this is something that, of course, uh, didn't happen in the other case. In the other case, it required a you know sort of a, a repeated sequence of local interactions for people to coordinate, and then when they were interacting outside of their groups, they failed to coordinate. Um, the other thing to notice also is that the variety of names that are showing up in this case. Um, you've got lots and lots and lots of names that I think are interesting also because of their cultural diversity. You've got names like uh, Tejash and Radu mixed with Aaron and Martin and Michael and David. Um, so you've got just this uh, tremendous variety of options showing up. And so the diversity of options present in the population actually isn't in any way an impediment uh, to coordination. Um, coordination is being driven sort of solely by the structure of the interaction network. Um, again, with, with very little to do with the operation, sorry, very little to do with the operation um, or the, you know, the available uh, behaviors that are sort of at, you know, at, at play in the population. Uh, so when we look at these dynamics sort of more carefully in terms of the overall result, uh, you can see that the spatial network and random network really had um, I, you know, dynamics that were essentially equivalent. Um, the, the mixing um, population, however, uh, converged uh, you know, to, to full convergence very, very quickly. There's a couple of really interesting things to look at in, in these results. The first is that um, you saw 40% uh, coordination um, in the spatial network as kind of the maximum amount of uh, success that any of the names got. So you're looking here as the, the y-axis is the fraction of people who have chosen um, a given option, and the, and the x-axis is the, the, the time scale for the evolution. So um, five rounds, 10 rounds, 15 rounds, up to 25 rounds. Um, and on the equivalent time scale, all of these ran for 25 rounds. Uh, we see that uh, really no options gain more than sort of 40% share of the population in the spatial network. When we look over to the random network, remarkably we see an equivalent thing. We see that in fact no options ever gain more than 40% on this, on this, in, within this time window. Um, and so that really tells us that not only are the, the dynamics kind of you know, visually and qualitatively similar, 
But quantitatively, we're actually seeing the exact same dynamics in the spatial network and in the random network. Um, now, when we move over to the random mixing case, what we see is that, uh, of course, the you know we get global coordination, but not only that, we get it on a very fast time scale. Um, and interestingly, if you look at about um, you know round eight or so, uh, right here, uh, you see a little uh, achievement of about 30 percent. I mean, at that point, this option already has more more um, uh, popularity in the population than any other option. Uh, and then that option takes off and gains dominance. Now, 30 percent, uh, you would think maybe kind of a magic number. Um, and this is something that when people think about critical mass dynamics, one of the very popular things to do is to say, well, what's the what's the critical fraction? What's the fraction at which we get takeoff? Um, the the really sort of compelling thing about these results is that they show that the fraction at which you get takeoff is totally uh, not the right question to ask. But in fact, it really has much more to do with the structure of the social network. So in both the spatial and random networks, you get 40% of the population coordinating, um, and yet you know it just it simply doesn't take off. Uh, and uh, and so the the mixing network is able to sort of get take off with a, a far lower um, coordination size as the kind of the initial group to to motivate. Um, uh, a dominant answer. Now, what I want to do next is compare these results, which are the empirical results, to the theoretical results. I'm going to play you the model that we used, um, that we were testing. This experimental design, which is the model of the name game. Um, and what you can see here is when we play out the model and, and report the exact same thing, which is um, the popularity of different names over the same time scale, uh, the most remarkable thing about these results is not only that they're qualitatively similar, but they're quantitatively almost identical, um, which is that we see that the dominant name gets about 40% you know, of the population in the spatial and random networks, and that you get really fast um, growth out of the, the mixing network on about the same time scale. Um, pretty interestingly, the mixing network is actually um, faster in the empirical case than it is um, uh, in, the, in the theoretical case. Uh, and so what's going on here is really what's called symmetry breaking. Um, and the underlying dynamics that govern this process uh, have to do with the change uh, between every option being uh, symmetrical in, in the sense of every option is a possibility, every option could in the long run win, um, versus one option breaking symmetry with the others and just becoming a, a clear dominant winner. Um, and it, on the time scales we're looking at, the spatial and random network, are unable to, to have any options break symmetry. Um, the networks actually constrain the ability of any of the options to kind of gain popularity. Um, but in the uh, fully connected network, you, the symmetry breaking takes place fairly early on, and then a, a, a sort of um, dominant winner emerges. And at, at that point, it becomes um, strongly path dependent. It, it doesn't actually reverse the process. Now, if we look a little bit more closely at it, there's, there's, a, there's a very clear dynamical clue that this is happening, which is the distribution of names in the population. So you can look here at about round five. We've got a, a close-up of the distribution of names. Um, and you can see that this, it, it, on, a, on a sort of log-log scale, this exhibits a slope of about negative one. This is like a zip law, um, where these names, uh, where some are more popular than others, but none are dramatically more popular, which is to say um, there aren't names with you know, many orders of magnitude more popularity than others. Uh, and what this does is this means that every names have, all of the names that are in play have sort of a, an equal foothold into the population. Now what happens at around 15 when this split starts to take place is that that, that distribution becomes more extreme. Um, and now you can see there's a couple of names that are starting to look like they you know, are, are moving up in the orders um, between them and the, the lowest names. So, so they have significantly more um, membership in the population than the lower names. And finally, around 25, where the split has, you know, become uh, final, um, here you see that there's basically one name that has almost everyone in the population. Um, and it's, you know, orders of magnitude more than um, the, the, most of the other names in the population. And and that's when with the sort of the defining signature of you know, symmetry breaking having take place in a kind of a winner take all state. Um, the next question to ask once we got these results 
was, uh, you know, how do these results generalize at scale? Now, of course, these experiments were run uh, for a population size of 24, and our model says that above a population size of 20, we can expect these dynamics to generalize. Um, so we could just stop there. <laughs> uh, but empirically, um, it's, you know, the, the most important question to ask um, is uh, whether or not that, that model really gives us any, any deep empirical insight um, into what happens when we start looking at, you know, hundreds or thousands of people. Um, and so our goal was to then look at larger populations. This is a very hard thing to do um, and a little bit risky um, in the sense that we were able to show the result we wanted to show um, and get some traction on this problem um, that one network versus another network makes a significant difference. And you're always worried that if you move to a larger population, you'll start to you know, lose clarity on the results just because the difficulty empirically of managing these kinds of dynamics at larger scales. Uh, nevertheless, we decided to conduct the experiment again um, with networks that were twice the size, so this time with 48. Um, now we know that because um, coordination failed in the spatial on the random networks with um, 24 nodes, that it's going to be even harder with 48 nodes. So we, we did replicate those, but they looked exactly the same. Uh, nothing happened and nothing would be expected to happen. The real question is whether the fully connected networks, the, the homogeneous mixing cases, would be able to sustain their success as we move to larger scales. And so here we replicated the study with n equals 48. And there are a couple of stunning things about these results. The first is that they're extremely clear that you know we we got on a on the same time scale um, we got the result. And the second is just how quickly um, the dynamics take off. Uh, that people um, were able to coordinate in a population of 50 people randomly interacting um, with neighbors, um, you can see by, by about round 15, you've got full coordination. Right? So this means that you've interacted with only, um, a, a given person has interacted with only about 14 or 15 other people, um, which means there's been no replication. So you've interacted with 15 strangers. And by the time you interact with a 16th stranger, you and that person are saying the exact same thing even though you've, you have no history of interacting with one another. Um, and then that just gets you know, uh, repeated throughout the population. Um, so that's a tremendously, uh, to, to my mind, um, interesting result because it gives us um, some real traction on the, the, uh, the you know, sort of generalization of these results to larger scales. Um, and it also tells us something interesting about, about the time scale, which in this case is actually faster than would have predicted theoretically. Um, and then, uh, just as a kind of a test, and we were a little bit nervous to do this, um, we thought it would be kind of cool to then uh, double the population size again. You know, what if we could study uh, 96 people or essentially 100 people uh, interacting online simultaneously um, in this space where they were totally blind as to how many people were interacting, um, how many people they were uh, playing with, um, and what the overall population size was. Uh, so we actually... Um, with some trepidation, ran this experiment uh, and, and got this result, um, which, again, to, <laughs> surprised us because of its clarity. Um, not only did the, the, the norm uh, converge, again, on, on an empirically tractable time scale, um, but it converged very quickly. Um, by, you know, by round 25, um, there was a clear dominant winner, um, and it was almost the process of, of convergence. And then by around 35, we essentially had convergence throughout the population. Uh, and so this gives us, again, uh, confidence that the theoretical model we've been using to describe the naming game model um, is actually a fairly uh, accurate way of thinking about these coordination dynamics uh, when there's sort of innovation at play. Um, as a final test, we replicated all of these studies several times just to make sure that we were getting the results. And that's always, again, um, a sort of uh, nerve nerve wracking thing to do as a, as a scientist because um, you never expect to get results that that cleanly match with your model and when you do there's always a temptation to like not touch anything uh, but we did we replicated everything um, several times and what that does is this gives us a very clean picture of the collective dynamic so um, the top row is the spatial um, networks um, and the random networks um, at different scales replicated. And the bottom row is the uh, modulus mixing networks um, 
uh, replicated at different scales. Uh, and what you can see is that in every single case, uh, the dynamics are you know essentially identical um, on the you know both in terms of the the um, the aggregate uh, success in in the the local networks and the um, also the time scales at which success occurs. And so this gives us a, a causal test where we can say let's compare the you know locally connected networks to the homogeneous mixing ca uh, cases, and we can see with a you know we have a a significance of 0.01 um, that there's a there's a significant causal effect of introducing network uh, connectivity or in increasing uh, the number of people that uh, those interact with on the likelihood that spontaneous social conventions will emerge despite the, pa the fact that people have no idea um, how many others they're interacting with. Um, and so from an application point of view, this provides some really nice intuitions about the sort of increasing connectedness in the online domain. Frequently it's the case that um, we know who, who we're connected to, but we don't know who our friends are, who their friends' friends are, and so forth. And so we have very little idea how large that space of potential location is, nor even who those people are. Um, and what these results say is that as that space becomes very large of friends of friends of friends of friends, um, we can still have uh, you know rapid large scale coordination on on normative behaviors that are spontaneously introduced by people in the network, um, which then sort of speaks to the question of what happens in terms of cultural homogeneity um, and these sort of homogenization processes more general. Um, on you know, on large, uh, highly interconnected online networks. Um, so, in conclusion, you know the, the question that you know is after at the very beginning was this question of the origins of social order, which is really can social conventions uh, really endogenously emerge without any of these institutional mechanisms in place to guide the social process? Um, and you know, I wanted to contrast this sort of the, the coordination perspective on this problem with the capacity uh, for people to independently innovate. Um, and what you know we found was a very clear um, empirical result um, that increased connectedness is able to uh, spontaneously generate uh, social conventions um, in a in a um, uh, replicable and sort of reliable way. Uh, and this gives rise to uh, a kind of a to me an exciting new way of thinking about um, the, the question of coordination and uh, collective behavior in social networks and particularly online social networks that can be studied uh, fairly rigorously using these um, online experiments uh, to think about evolution of social norms and also think about what this means for um, the connections between uh, some fairly specific policy problems and basic research on network dynamics. Uh, one of the policy problems that I've been thinking about most recently is, for example, the spread of um, beliefs about vaccination behaviors, about whether or not vaccination is uh, safe or dangerous. Um, and you can think about it. This is a, you know, obviously has a kind of strong normative quality to it, and and doesn't just take on the dimensions of a single behavior or a single belief or idea spreading, like a contagion, but actually has a kind of creative, responsive uh, element to it, where people are sort of learning from each other and then developing their own ideas and so forth. Um, and when we think about how these sort of beliefs, particularly ones that are you know, externally seem sort of odd, ever get traction or grow in a population, these dynamics help help to give us a way of thinking about how these dynamics um, evolve. And then from a social engineering perspective, what we might do or be able to think about in terms of being able to uh, alter these dynamics um, collectively. Uh, so that's the, I, I want to sort of stop there um, with talking about the, the collective dynamics. There's more to say in terms of, lots of people have questions about um, you know, individual behaviors uh, and so forth, but uh, we can sort of, um, we can get into that if, if people want to see more. Uh, but I'm, I'm willing to take questions now and hear about people's reactions. Uh, so thank you very much. Can you hear us now? Yes, of course. Right. Christian, I'll repeat them. I'll repeat them. So the example you showed uh, is from where's from the name? Hi. Hi. <laughs> I think they can even hear me here, right? Yeah, yeah, but both will hear me now. <laughs> it works. So uh, the, the example you gave, uh, it, it converged on the name John.
And I was wondering if there was a general pattern where people converged on popular names, so maybe like conventions, feedback on conventions kind of thing? Yeah, so the names actually differed. I mean, we did, we did some analyses on which names were selected. Um, there was no significant uh, bias in one name versus another. Um, the name John showed up in, in one of the other um, networks with a male face. Um, the name, um, I think, Brad was chosen. Um, the name Steve was chosen another one. Um, so in terms of a popular name, yes, I, I think that there's some sense that there's a kind of a cultural reference here in the sense that the name um, uh, Hussein didn't show up in the, in the names, or if it did show up, it wasn't selected. Um, but I think that the interesting, there's two interesting um, points about that. One is that just simply having John in the network, in the set of choices available, um, didn't mean that the network would converge, right? So it's not sufficient to have a name like that in order to generate convergence, nor is it necessary, um, right? Because the other names could be chosen. So when we think of those popular names, we can think of, yes, they, they may show up, but if they're neither necessary nor sufficient, they don't really tell us much about how these social norms emerge. I can see Matt. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting stuff. I, I think one organizing principle you might think about. There's a paper by Stephen Morris, which looks at the idea that whether a group has more, so in, in the case of peer coordination as, as a mixed game, would be whether or not you have more links in versus out. And in, right. So, Matt, can I ask you, that's a very interesting point. Can I ask you a sort of follow-up about that? Because I want to understand whether the dynamics you're talking about are driven by, uh, for example, something like modularity in the actual topology, or is, the, or is the group structure that he's discussing emergent, like the groups that we saw here that weren't a function of the topology um, in the sense that the groups weren't defined by um, more or less connectedness. They were really just an emergent function of, of patterns of interaction. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you could end up with a convention sticking on that and, and being different from what surrounds it. No, I, I agree. I agree entirely. And in fact, there, there are some very interesting results on more modular networks, which, as I mentioned before, all, all of these three topologies eventually lead to, um, you know, in, in infinite time, eventually lead to convergence. The question we're interested here is with the, the question of uh, time scale. Um, but yes, it's true that uh, that there's some very nice results um, by that author, but also I know the ones by other authors, uh, thinking about modular networks more general, uh, generally, and so can show that with high levels of modularity, you actually can lose the capacity for convention formation, you can, which is the, the thing I think you're saying, which is that you actually get stable heterogeneity across the population. Yes, absolutely. Right. 
Yeah. Oh, that's exactly right. That, um, that uh, most of the theoretical work on the coordination problem um, has focused on this question of, uh, when you say bias, we tend to think of that as either payoff dominance or risk dominance. So in the vein of the harshan yuzelt solution, um, and most of the work here has been done uh, on risk dominance. You can think of like Ellison here, and a lot of the really interesting work by Young and um, others who have sort of run off of that. Um, that that work has really emphasized, you know, the rate at which the risk dominant solution is chosen in the population. And, and you're absolutely right that that work has emphasized the value of spatial uh, connectedness for that process. Um, this is where I tried to emphasize the, the value of um, obviously e equal options, but also innovation, um, which really adds the sort of diffusion component into the process where it's just not there in the same way if everyone has the same set of options available to them at the outset. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that's the, I think that that's a fascinating point. Um, and I've, I've done some work on this question when it was applied to the, the problem of collective action. Um, and the way that we think about that in collective action context is something like coalition formation. If you separate a smaller group from the population, allow them to interact, um, you can solve coordination dilemmas that actually exist at a larger scale um, just through the, you know, the reduction of costs of interacting. Um, I'm not sure that modularity solves that problem, however, because um, in, in the way that you're thinking about it, modularity um, would need to somehow be dynamic. That is to say, you need to have a small group, and then in order to go interact with the rest of the population, then you need to sort of subsequently have a different network structure for interaction. Um, so you need to have a kind of sequential network of some sort, where it was initially modular and then somehow um, more connected in order to get the initial critical mass exposed to the population. And the question of, of, in some ways, critical mass, which is the question that it seems like you're getting at, um, is incredibly interesting in this case, because, for example, all of the, na all of the faces that were female faces um, solicited female names, um, and all of the male faces solicited male names, which we saw very conspicuously in those uh, models I played, or in the um, uh, movies I played, but uh, we also ran experiments trying to see if we could generate, you know, using kind of a critical mass approach, uh, generate norms that were um, completely uh, culturally unexpected. You know, a female name for a male face, um, uh, names that violated racial expectations for the, for the color of the face, and names that violated both gender and racial expectations um, for the face. And it, it, it turns out that... Um, you can actually do this fairly effectively, um, even in the fully connected network. Um, there is actually a kind of a critical minority size, but if you get a minority above a certain amount, um, which turned, it's about 25%, um, you, can, you can spread a, 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 a sort of unconventional norm that then will become the sort of locked in social convention. Um, to say, I can just show you a quick example of that. Um, if, you, if I said what name would be selected for this particular face, uh, you can see here, um, the, the, you can see the name in red, green, uh, blue, and purple. Um, and the interesting thing is the red name wins, um, but you know, by around, at around five, 
it's actually not the dominant name. So it's not the case that the committed minority was always the most popular name. Um, but through, through uh, repeated interactions, uh, the name that actually won was uh, Nia for that phase, right, compared with Eric, Sean, and Hans. Um, and to, uh, to my mind, that, that gets to the kind of thing you're talking about. And I think that's actually um, one of the more interesting implications of these kinds of dynamics when we think about what this means for you know, social policy more generally, the kinds of things that can happen online, whether you know, small groups could self-organize and actually generate normative convergence um, over a population. One of the more interesting things to look at also is not just can you generate it from an initial state, but can you flip a norm, right? Once a norm gets sort of locked in in a population, how much work does it take or how big does that minority need to be to actually change the equilibrium state from one to another? Um, and how flexible is that process once uh, once lock-in is achieved? Okay, what I'm going to do now is uh, we're going to send people off for their um, break, for their tea break, uh, coffee break. Anyone who wants to stay and ask more questions can just stay, because I'm going to stay and talk to them anyway. And we'll see the rest of you back for the next session. Thanks, speaker. Great, thank you.